forward to file. There we go. Okay, welcome ESCA office hours, June 11th. Uh, this is the ESCA federal programs team, and I will kick it off uh, this morning to get us started with Jess. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted to provide an update. I am having a baby in early July or any time. So um, we will reach out at that point and let you know who the new point of contact will be for my regions in Aristic and Kennebec counties. So if you have any immediate questions or want to get my feedback on anything before I'm out on leave, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I will pass it off to Shelly to share her exciting news as well. Good morning, everyone. We do have some exciting news, in my opinion. I will be rejoining the ESEA team as their director. I am currently serving the role as the director of the Emergency Relief Federal Programs. So hopefully my name is familiar to some of you, but I look forward to the continued support to the districts that I'll be able to provide in the new role and the transition to the ESEA team. Great. Am I sharing the right screen? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jess and Shelly. Exciting news for sure for our team. I'm gonna get us into the nitty gritty. The FY25 ESCA applications are available to begin drafting with preliminary allocations um, that are in the system. You wanna navigate to Grants for Me. Your left-hand navigation has funding. Uh, funding applications and your drop down there on the top of that page will have all of your existing ones and you can go to FY25 for ESEA consolidated and start by clicking draft started kind of on the top of that sections page where you're used to clicking on status revisions and changes. Note that preliminary amounts are subject to change, hopefully not too drastically, but they do. Um, also note that that means you're not submitting or clicking draft completed until those final allocations are uploaded within grants for me. And again, the ESCA FY25 application is due August 1st. Uh, for districts or for um, sometimes a co-op that has a district um, uh, or an AOS, if you're refusing funds, you click ESCA funds refused. You don't want to start a draft. Um, it'll kind of put you in the system and pull you in and you'll start getting all the messages and you'll start thinking you have to do something when your school or your district has refused funds. So be sure um, for any application that's available where you don't take funds that that's the status that you choose instead of starting a draft. And then, of course, just a really important understanding about FY25 and the funding related to this application, you cannot begin obligating funds uh, until you receive substantial approval, um, which will be the date that it is received by the DOE in substantially approvable form. So if you're familiar with a consultant checklist, which is a really big tool that we use for revisions, well, mostly for application acceptance, you have the early part of the checklist that is your substantial approval items, those all have to be approvable. And then the bottom of that checklist is your final approval items. So if you submitted on August 8th in substantial approval, I reviewed it the 16th, your substantial approval date is the 8th when you submitted it in substantially approvable form. And that does show up in your history log. And I believe it shows up um, in your invoicing system. So that is really important to note. Obviously, you should be spending down your most your oldest funds, 23, 24. But just note that for 25, substantial approval is a very important date for obligation. Resources for this exist on our webpage. They also exist on Grants for Me, the homepage there on our website. Training videos, um, things that I'll talk about here in a moment with the user access guide. And obviously reach out to your regional program manager with questions, especially before you, if you have some questions and don't want to start doing things, reach out to them. It could be a quick phone call or a quick email to um, seek any clarity that you are looking for for this uh, part of the process. So this is near and dear to my heart. I just want to really make this public service announcement. The address book in grants for me is not just there for us to find your email to bother you with details or ask you something. 
it is there as your workflow and it is there as particular user roles that are incredibly important to the functioning of this grant. So if I if there's one thing that I could beg you guys all to do this month is to ensure, because I know there's some personnel changes that might happen July 1. So even if it's uh, after that, to really look at your address books for your grants, including and not just including ESEA. But it's really important that you have your correct superintendent in the LEA authorized representative role, that you have two user access administrators unless in case one goes mid-year or is unable to help. One ESEA consolidated applic application director that is the centralized leader of this grant when it comes to the content of the grant and submitting it. Um, they should not be the fiscal rep. It's really important that we have internal controls and that your business manager and your superintendent are aware of the budgets with your schools, your district projects, and can check and see sort of how things look and whether they jive with the vision and the planning that happened during the annual needs assessment. So this is a really big deal to be familiar and to be constantly sort of in the know that your address book is up to date. It's also how we send automatic notifications. So this is why business managers and coordinators are on this call today, because I select that role when I send out automatic notifications. So that's another reason to have this be uh, up to date. We do have a guide that follows step-by-step -step on how to remove people and add people. So take a look at that. And of course, you can always ask your regional program manager, but this is incredibly important. Every year, your address book needs to be accurate. This is for principals too, for LEA view, because they, they do look at budgets, that first revision. And I have had districts be delayed because they didn't realize this step. So it's really important that you feel good about your, your grants from me address book. I'm gonna shoot it off to Ryan. All right, speaking of some things that can delay substantial approval, uh, I wanna provide a, a couple timely reminders about things that you uh, hopefully have either already done or are working on right now. First and foremost, you know, you wanna make sure that your district is having your public comment period on your ESEA application. If you haven't already sometime here in the near future, the public has to be given an opportunity to provide comments on your general plan for how you're going to spend funds. So you wanna make sure that that public comment period is somewhere that is of course public, which means not just on the email list for your elementary school, right? It's gonna be wherever you do your public notifications. Uh, oftentimes we see a lot of folks use their school board agendas and meetings to either open the public comment period or close the public comment period because those agendas are posted ahead of time. They're posted in the same place, hopefully every month or however often you have your board meetings. And that allows anyone, not just those of students at the school, to be able to provide their public comment on how their federal funds are being spent. So that's something you want to make sure you're doing, uh, as well as updating the CNA, right? There's a part of the ESCA application that asks you uh, what you've done now to update your CNA with the most recent data that you have available to you, the names of the stakeholders who are involved in that process, the dates you might have held meetings. And of course, as part of monitoring, we do check that you actually put those updates into the living, breathing CNA documents. You want to make sure you're doing that as well. Uh, another timely piece of information is to make sure you're reaching out to your partners at the non-public schools that might exist within your geographic SAU. Uh, Title I preliminary estimates are updated now with FY25 data on our, the allocations page of our website. Uh, you, of course, want to reach out to your uh, partners to begin the consultation form. There is a new form this year. It's located within the ESEA application. And you'll notice in that form, there is a checkbox that needs to be filled out by our non-public partners stating that they attended our training or have watched the recording of our training. We want to make sure that everyone's on the same page with the requirements that come with ESEA funds, especially when it comes to equitable services. So we are requiring them to have attended or watched this training. When it comes to those equitable services for titles two, three, and four, you know, of course, we're all aware you get an equitable service percentage. That percentage applies to the total amount of funding allocated in each title after any transfers have occurred and after any administrative funds have been taken out. So if your district wishes to transfer funds between titles, 
that's something you have to agree with the non-public school on during consultation. You can't simply transfer all of your, say, Title IV into Title I without them agreeing that that's something they are okay with. Um, remember that consultation really needs to be focused on the needs of the students in that school and how those funds can be spent to meet those needs. Just like our public SAUs, our non-public schools have to establish SMART goals to measure if those funds are being spent effectively. And we try to remind everyone of this as often as we can. The LEA, the SAU here, is the fiscal agent. Federal funds are never paid directly to the non-public school. If materials are being purchased, they are being purchased by the LEA and then given to the non-public school. If someone is being paid, that person is being paid through the public LEA, not through the non-public's payroll. Yes. Um, so sometimes when things pop up a lot in invoices where we have to ask a lot of questions, there's some back and forth on just confirming allowability of the expense. So one of those items that has been cropping up quite a bit is furniture. So with Title I, you can potentially pay for specialized furniture if it aligns with your needs assessment and and your high need areas that are identified in the application. We wanna note that in order to approve this type of expense, you ideally this is an application and, and we can just go ahead and approve and say it's already been um, checked for allowability. But if you are in a targeted program in particular, then that furniture can only be used by those targeted Title I students. So we'll need to make sure that is confirmed when approving that expense. And as with any ESE expense, it must be reasonable, necessary, and allocable to the specific grant. Um, yes, and just on the, on the right-hand side, we just have some information on where you can put those details. Again, right directly in the application, would be um, my recommendation. So you can get that approved ahead of time. And in general, for this type of expense in particular, you must provide that documentation on how it is meeting that greater purpose of Title I. That's right, because everything is geared towards educational programming, bottom line. Um, Ryan, you again. All right. Hopefully uh, a timely piece of information for folks that we've learned as we've done monitoring this year from the world of Title IIa. So one of our Title IIa monitoring items is that SAUs have to show evidence they've collaborated on what sort of professional development topics are going to be covered and paid for with their Title IIa funds. And so the uh, statute lists out, lists out teachers, principals, paraprofessionals, parents, and community partners and organizations. So that means that if you are spending your Title IIa funds on professional development and you're doing this collaboration, you need to make sure you're saving evidence of that actually happening. This is something that having worked in schools for a decade, I know happens in the vast majority of places uh, most of the time, right? You're at the end of the year, you're talking with your building principals, you're talking with your teachers, you're talking with your leadership teams, your community groups about what went well this year, what needs you still see, you know, over the summer you start to dig into that planning about what you're gonna do for the next school year. What we're seeing with a lot of folks though is they're not able to document that work. They don't have say a survey they sent out to the staff to ask them what their PD needs are, or they didn't take minutes that are dated from a particular meeting with their stakeholders. So something that could probably apply to every one of our titles and everything that's required is just the reminder to document, 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 right? Over document if you have to have something that's written and dated. And then if anyone ever asks, we have that evidence that this consultation actually occurred. Dan, Daniel. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize that my video is not working. Uh, so you just get to see a nice little beach scene there. Um, <laughs> so with Title III, uh, we do have some consortium opportunities. And so any um, SAUs that are wishing to, or sorry, uh, I should say any LEAs wishing to form a consortium would need to reach the statutory required minimum um, of $10,000. Um, anybody that's wishing to form a consortium for the purpose of Title III only 
um, not Title One, Two, or Four, or Five. This is only for Title Three. There is an intent, uh, intent to apply form posted on our website, um, and these would need to be submitted by June thirtieth. Um, so prior to final allocations, so we know exactly who is participating in co-ops and who is not. Um, we did get some exciting news from USDE. Um, they did confirm that Maine DOE is able to be part of a consortium and is allowed to be the fiscal agent of that consortium. So right now we're investigating what this would look like for FY25 and what steps would be needed in order to make this happen. Um, and then we also have our consortium informational video posted on YouTube, um, and I can go ahead and throw that link in the chat for folks if they're interested. Great. Tyra. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is just a reminder that we do hold federal fiscal office hours um, the last Thursday of every month. The Next one is June 25th, and you can um, register at the DOE event calendar web, web page. Next slide. So FY25 um, funds, now is not the time to engage in contracted services using FY25 ESEA funds to support such services. Remember your contract cannot contain any dates prior to the substantial approval date of your FY25 application. Services must be rendered during the period of performance for the grant and invoiced for before the expiration of the liquidation period. I am seeing um, an uptick in invoices for subscriptions and subscriptions for three and six years, they are not eligible for reimbursement with um, these ESEA federal funds. These funds are available for a 27 month period. So that's just a reminder, please be sure to check your substantial approval date. And if um, you are uh, proof for pre-award costs, that just brings the date back to 7-1-24, not before that. So please make sure that you are paying attention to those dates when invoicing. Next. So this just reiterates that all invoice, that all expenses need to be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. Um, and your important dates are the substantial approval date in the period of performance. All invoices that are submitted into grants for me need to have the minimum detailed um, expenditure run, and we reserve the right to ask for additional um, backup when necessary. Please, when you're splitting um, invoices between two grant years, so if you're splitting between FY23 and FY24, and you're doing so for salary and benefits, you need to split salary and benefits appropriately. So in other words, do not submit an invoice for just salaries in one year, and then the benefits in the next. Next. Grants for me error messages. This happens when um, you haven't budgeted for a certain category. And so it won't allow you to put your expenses in the appropriate category. And you just see that, oh, but I have money left over here. I'm just going to take the expense from that. Please don't do that. Ask for a budget revision. And as you're filling out your um, FY25 applications and you have to budget into categories, these are for targeted assistance schools or for funds that you are not including in your school-wide plan, that you avoid um, the 9,000 category. There shouldn't be any expenses in the 9,000 category. 8,000 is for subscriptions and membership fees. So hopefully that will be helpful. And, and, and if you're 
in what um sorry budgeting for salaries make sure you do so for benefits as well this is just your reminder of what is open right now for um and available to you for invoicing please please look at the ones highlighted they are coming up on expiration if we don't um, get the tidings amendment waiver fy23 funds will also um, expire 9 30 24. Here's some fun facts. Um, this is what is remaining in each of these um, grants that are potentially um, closing out 9-30-24. So I encourage you to go into Grants for Me, look at your balances on these grants and start invoicing for, for expenses. Who has right, a slide? Yep, okay. it's me. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't find my unmute button there for a minute. No, I just want to remind everybody about um, the Maine Department of Ed's uh, PD calendar uh, that we have available. There's a lot of opportunities coming up here over the next couple of weeks, couple months. Um, so be sure you're kind of checking in there, um, particularly if you're looking for PD opportunities uh, for your staff here over the summer. And of course, um, we have our contact information here uh, for anyone who may be new to their role and not exactly sure who uh, they should be reaching out to on the team for support, uh, particularly as we look to the FY25 application beyond. Uh, we do break up the state by superintendent region. Uh, you can see your contacts here. As we indicated earlier, uh, Jess is soon to be out on maternity leave. And so we'll be kind of be redistributing some folks from the um, um, regions that she's working with. So uh, keep an eye out for that information uh, in the near future. Great. I'm going to stop share. I will